Welcome everyone. This is Becky from TechSoup, and I would like to welcome you today to Assessing the Cloud for Nonprofits and Libraries, where we'll be talking about email and collaboration using Microsoft Office 365. And today we are going to just do a little bit of housekeeping as we get started. You are able to chat to, and raise your hand if you have any questions. You can feel free to join us in the chat box by asking questions down here on your screen. You can also raise your hand and we can help you if you have any issues or problems or if you have any questions. We will have people on the back end who will help collect your questions throughout the duration of the webinar, and we'll try and answer some through the webinar, but also have a Q&A at the end. All of our lines will be muted except for our presenters today. So if you have questions, please join us in the chat. If you lose your Internet connection, reconnect using the link that you received in your confirmation email. And here's the number, uh, the number in your confirmation email is also what you can use to rejoin the call. You should be hearing the audio through your computer. If you're not, obviously you'll be chatting to us and we can give you the call-in number. And you can also reach ReadyTalk support at this 800 number here. You are also being recorded today. So this is going to be archived after the webinar. In case you have anything that you miss, you don't have to furiously be taking notes because it will be available to you and will be sent around with the PowerPoint slides, any links discussed, and this recording. If you are tweeting, feel free to tweet at pound TechSoup. So just to get us started, who is TechSoup? If this is your first time joining us, we are part of TechSoup Global. and We are working towards the day when every nonprofit, library, and social benefit organization on the planet has the technology, knowledge, and resources they need to operate at their full potential. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we have served more than 183,000 organizations. We have partners in 40 countries around the world, and 52 donor partners including companies like Microsoft, Adobe, Cisco, and Symantec. So feel free to join us on our website for more information about who we are and why we do these webinars for our nonprofit and library community. So I'd like to introduce you to our presenters today. We are going to be joined on the line by Sam Chankin from Tech Impact. He's a systems analyst and leads the solution research and development at Tech Impact. Um, he will be joining us as well as Linda Widdup, who is the Director of Technology Services at Tech Impact. And we are talking about te Tech Impact today, but their name was formerly NPower Pennsylvania, so I just want to mention that in case people who saw that in the registration are wondering, well, who is this Tech Impact? And we will also have on the line Stephanie Borton, who is the Associate Director at ArtReach in Philadelphia. She'll be, she'll be joining us later in the conversation just to share some of her personal experience at their organization when they decided to try to move to the cloud. So just a quick look at our agenda, and then we'll dive into the content and invite our speakers to join us on the line. So the agenda, what is the cloud? We know a lot of people hear that term but don't necessarily know what it means or it could mean to them. We'll talk a little bit about what NGOs and libraries think about the cloud, and some of that is based on our TechSoup Global 2012 cloud survey that was conducted around the world earlier this year, what it could mean to move your organization to the cloud, and then we'll talk a little bit about the Office 365 product and case study, which is the product that um, Stephanie's organization ended up moving to with the help of NP Cloud and Tech Impact. We'll talk about what that is. And then we'll talk about the offering of NP Cloud through TechSoup and get to your questions and resources. So with that, I'd like to invite Linda and Sam to unmute themselves and go ahead and take it away with their presentation about Tech Impact and the cloud. Thanks, Becky. Hi, everyone. This is Linda from Tech Impact. Um, although our name has changed from NPower Pennsylvania to Tech Impact, our mission hasn't changed. Our mission stands. Um, as it has for the past nine years to inspire and empower nonprofits to use technology to better serve their communities. Basically, our mission is to help you use technology to meet your mission. Um, we've been doing this locally in Philadelphia area since um, I guess 2002, and now 
we've moved to a national, we're trying to move to a national footprint using um, our brand NP Cloud. And the reason that we're doing this should become apparent um, through this presentation. But basically, we're starting an NP Cloud brand to offer cloud-based solutions to nonprofits throughout the, the country and even internationally. We've got a couple of products that are, that are already available, um, including NP Base, NP Office, NP Talk, and NP Vault. And today we're going to be talking about um, a lot of these offerings, and specifically Sam will be doing that. Um, so let's start by talking about the cloud. What is the cloud? Well, the cloud is a general term for anything that involves delivering services over the Internet. And a lot of you are already using the cloud, and, and you may or may not know it. You're using the cloud if you're using um, an email solution such as Gmail or um, Hotmail. You're using the cloud in, in various ways uh, in your daily personal life and probably in your professional life as well. So we're going to uh, talk about what makes the cloud possible. Here's what makes the cloud possible, and, and this is what has really inspired our, new, our vision for, for uh, Tech Impact. What makes the cloud possible today is bandwidth. Um, bandwidth meaning inexpensive, high quality bandwidth. So in the past we were using dial-up, we were using DSL, we were paying a lot of money for T1 lines and, and that kind of a thing. And now we can get a, a cable connection or a Fios connection or an upgraded, band, um, upgraded Internet connection at really reasonable rates, somewhere between $50 a month and say $300 a month, which is, which is amazing. Um, virtualization, the fact that we can build servers without having to buy hardware and equipment. Um, automated software, and then massive data centers. There are back-end providers now that have built out massive data centers with hardware that is, it will blow your mind. Take a look at it. Here it is. This is, Microsoft, this is one of Microsoft's data centers. This is the way that, that technology is provided now. What you're looking at here is a picture of a warehouse with container trucks. These are like container trucks that you see on the highway. They take them off the wheels, they fill them, they stack and pack them with servers. There are servers front to back, top to bottom inside here. Um, these data centers provide millions and trillions of, of bits and bytes and are all virtualized, meaning that if one of them breaks down, Microsoft simply shuts it down, shuts it off. And then once the container truck needs to refresh, they put it back on wheels, send it out to the manufacturer, and have it all refreshed. So that's pretty amazing stuff. Um, Sam, you want to jump in and talk, um, tell us anything else about that data center stuff? Cause I know oh, we'll be covering more some more of that you. later. So I think okay. that's fine for now. Okay, great. Um, so what are nonprofits and libraries saying about the cloud? We've got really great information here. Um, TechSoup Global ran, recently ran a cloud survey. You may, your organization may have been one of the 10,000 plus respondents to this survey. And we're just going to go real quickly through some of the um, highlights of that, of that survey. And we can see here that 90% of respondents said that they do use some cloud, some form of cloud computing solutions. And that 60% say that lack of knowledge about the cloud is the greatest barrier to adoption. That statistic there is what has prompted us to want to run these seminars and these webinars um, to promote that education so that everybody understands what the cloud can do for organizations. Um, and, and as Becky said earlier, we're going to make this presentation available. So I'm not going to go through every single statistic in, in these slides. It's just an overview real quick. Um, so here's lack of knowledge as a barrier to adoption. We can see that 60% of the respondents stated that this is, one, this is their main barrier to um, moving to cloud 
solutions. And on this one, reducing cost is the greatest motivator. So, and we've also found that this is true at Tech Impact. We are getting uh, phone calls daily. How can I reduce my IT spend? Well, one of the best ways to do that in today's world is to move to cloud technology. And we're going to see through the case study and through some of the other um, information that Sam is going to present in a minute why that holds true. Um, so we can reduce our cost. We can have easy setup. It's very, it's very easy for you as the IT technology consumer to have cloud technology set up for you. Um, so we'll see that as well. I told you what our mission was. Our mission is to help nonprofits meet their mission through the use of technology. This is what motivates our team. Our team wants to think big, start small, and move fast. Um, and that's a, a really good thing for us to do with cloud technology. Think big. We are thinking big. We are thinking really big. The sky's the limit with cloud technology. Pun kind of intended there. Um, start small. We have found technologies like Microsoft Office 365 that can help nonprofits find um, a really big impact with a small step towards the cloud by doing that. And move fast. We are moving fast. We are trying to move most of our local nonprofits and a lot of national nonprofits onto um, some form of cloud technology really quickly. Um, so I told you what our mission is. Here is our not so secret mission. Um, our secret mission <laughs> is to eliminate on-premise exchange servers and nonprofits. Our team of technicians here, we've been doing this for nine years, and I can tell you that the bane of our existence is exchange server. Um, having, to maintain, having to purchase them, having to maintain them, having to back them up properly, having to um, restore email, and having it take two, three, four days, even up to two weeks to get email restored because this is the picture that you're seeing here is a typical server closet as it were. Um, and we don't want to deal with that anymore. So <laughs> we want to get rid of that mess that you're looking at. We want to help the nonprofit reduce costs and reduce costs to purchase the hardware, to do the maintenance, to do the backups. All of, those things, all of those costs are reduced by moving to the cloud for your um, email, including Office 365. Um, we want to improve reliability. Microsoft servers, those servers that you saw in the container trucks, they're not going to crash that often. And if they do crash, your email just gets moved immediately to another server. So it's not down. So and reliability is improved. Improving user experience rather than have, you see the you see what these servers in the picture look like they're old they're old models of servers they're one two three five seven eight years old the user experience on these on the servers that are that you're looking at here that's eight year old technology in some cases so the user experience is eight years behind the curve. Provide true anytime, anywhere connectivity. Because we're working from the cloud, all the user needs is an Internet connection and they can get to their updated, um, soft, updated email and software immediately. So we can work from anywhere now. So that's our mission. Anyway, that's our not so secret mission. Um, we're we're working with uh, – so here's an, a slide about benefits to the organization. Lower cost of ownership. I've already mentioned this. Um, you can save thousands of dollars in hardware. I think that the minimum hardware build for an Exchange server um, using you know, a Dell or HP server is probably – the minimum would be what, – what would you say, Sam, $2,400? Yeah, that's exactly what I'd say. For something like that. And, and the maintenance cost, you have to have a maintenance support contract to have somebody making sure the, the updates are done, etc. Um, you don't have to worry about upgrades to the 
platform. Why? Because Microsoft is going to upgrade that in the background. They're going to upgrade it once, and everybody benefits from that upgrade. So we don't have to worry about upgrading software. Predictable expenses. We can calculate now how much it's going to cost for email on a per user basis because we know exactly how much that costs. We don't have to, to guess at it anymore. Um, upgraded user experience through Outlook, and especially Outlook Web Access. The Outlook Web Access that's provided with Office 365, they don't even call it that anymore, um, is beautiful. It's almost like looking at Outlook. You can do everything you can do in Outlook you can do on the web. Um, mobile device integration, any smartphone, iPhone, um, Android phone, it all connects, no problem. But the biggest thing that I think is uh, the one thing that's overlooked when we're moving organizations to the cloud is the opportunity to change workflow and work habits in the user. This has been a big, um, a big talking point at NPower and at Tech Impact and our board of directors. It's all well and good that we can get rid of a hardware layer, but what does that really do for the user? How does that impact and benefit the organization? How does that work? It works by providing better ways for users to manage their data and to work and to collaborate. And I think that this is something that Stephanie is going to take um, help us wor work through today. So um, this is our value. At Tech Impact, it still says NPower on this slide because our new name is so new. We've been working with um, Office 365 since before it was called Office 365. It was called BPOS, Business Productivity Online Suite which is a mouthful. Um, we've been working with it for over two years now. We've got over 100 organizations on this platform with 3,000 seats. Um, so we know what we're doing. We've migrated 100 organizations. We've migrated them from Pop Email, from Exchange, from Google, from any form of old-fashioned email to Office 365. Um, We've got relationships direct with Microsoft. Because we've migrated so many organizations, uh, Microsoft now has us in this SMB Cloud Champion Club Tier 3 partner, whatever that means. But basically it means that we've got, we've got a direct connect with their tech department and with um, an account rep that helps us out when we need it. So um, anyway, that's that's my part of the uh, presentation. I'm going to turn it over to Sam now to talk tech. Hello. Um, okay, so I'm going to start uh, by talking a little bit about security. I was not planning on talking about security, but enough of you uh, wrote in that you wanted to hear about it that I, I decided to have a word. Um, this is something that I frequently get and as an IT person sometimes just shake my head about, but I, I do understand the visceral fear of giving up control um, and moving something out of your infrastructure and into someone else's environment where, where it feels at least like you have a lot less control. Um, so I want to start with a quick little exercise. Um, I'm going to ask uh, some, uh, some poll questions here, and I, I want you to answer honestly about your organization. Uh, so if you want to go to the next slide maybe. Sure. So go ahead and Tell us how much of this stuff are you doing? Are you, do you know who your network is, who is on your network as an administrator? Do you back up data, data to another physical location? Do you have a firewall in place? Do you pay attention to your security logs? So take a moment and just tell us if you do none of those, a few of those, most of these, all of these, or you're just not sure. Okay, so these are all a little bit of time. These are all bare minimum standards for network security. Right? If you're not doing these things, you should be pretty concerned, um, I, I think, as an IT provider. Not, I will say, that I don't know quite a few nonprofit organizations who, who don't do these things. And the fact of the matter is you know, it's annoying to do them. It's not your mission to be providing your technology. It's your mission to be helping your clients. Um, so it looks like most of you are doing at least a few of these. A bunch of you are doing uh, most of them. So, so that's great. I would say this is a pretty representative sample. 
Um, about half doing most, a few of these, and half doing uh, most or, or all of them. Um, so let's go ahead to the next slide. Uh, so okay. for this one, I want to know, for your organization, do you back up everything uh, in your organization to a second location? Do you have everything in a se second physical location? Um, do you um, perform regular restore testing to make sure that your data is actually usable? So besides backing up that data, have you actually ever tested a restore to make sure that that information is usable? And do you do okay, that? We'll give a few more seconds and then we'll skip to the results. So 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, so a few of these seems to be the majority of our respondents, 39%. And it's still changing a little, 40% now. Um, so yeah, it seems like there are a few people doing, or the, the majority of people are doing a few of these things, but not all of them necessarily. And there are quite a few people who are doing none or who are not sure as well. So with that, we'll skip on to the next poll question, similar kind of question. So do you replicate your data for instant failover? Do you have waterless fire protection in your office? So if there is a fire, you have the ability, you have the ability to um, put it out without destroying your servers or all of your data. So go ahead and take a moment and answer this question as well. We've only gotten a few people responding so far. But go ahead and tell us if you're doing none of these, a few of these, most of these, all of these, or if you're just not sure. And we can skip to the results in just a moment and let Sam continue with his presentation. So with that, I will say 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and we'll skip to the results and see what everybody is saying. So 36% are doing none of these things or have none of these things happening regularly. That's a pretty okay. sizable chunk of people in our group um, who don't have these types of systems set up that the large cloud providers do have set up to protect your data. So with that, I'll let Sam jump back into his presentation. Oh, and um, okay. we have somebody actually asking, what is instant failover? So if that could be instant, explained. Sure. So instant failover means that if your server goes down, if your Internet connection fails, if something goes wrong, do you have a second set of networking equipment, of servers, of infrastructure to take up that load immediately without actually being felt by your users? Um, so that's instant failover. So all of these things are things that cloud providers give you. I mean, that's, that's what you're paying them for. You are aggregating your users with thousands of other users, many of them from large you know, Fortune 500 companies. So they give these service providers the resources that they need to have these fire suppression systems, these 24-7 engineers. I can also tell you that most of your cloud providers are encrypting all of your data during, during transmission, so it's not traveling over the Internet unencrypted. Your data is separate from other, uh, from other clients. So you're not on the same, you know, other clients can't just kind of peek their head over, um, over the dividing wall and take a look at, at your data. It's designed to not allow that. They monitor for questionable activities like a credit card does, right? You often your credit card company knows before you do that your credit card has been stolen. And it's exactly the same for these cloud providers. And they actually back everything up and they know how to restore it. I would be surprised if most um, or, or even many of you knew how to restore every piece of data in your organization. If your database server fails, you actually know how to get that back up and running. And the fact of the matter is they probably won't need to restore anything anyway because they have all these redundant services. Things are replicated to multiple geographic locations. They really know what they're doing. Um, so this, you know, this security question, all of these things that you get with a cloud provider are things that you don't get um, when, you know, when you're just on your network, when you're at your firewall, and you're not, really, you know, you're not really monitoring those logs. You don't really know what's going on as an average nonprofit. Um, now that's not to say that there aren't issues um, with cloud providers related to security and backup. So, uh, but these, these are really what you should be worrying about. So the first one, uh, I saw a question earlier. 
um, you know, someone's overwriting our, my files. Our users are deleting files. So one of the things you need to ask your cloud backup provider are how granular are your backups. I guarantee they're doing backups to prevent against large-scale failure. Their data center explodes, right? wipes off the map. Um, or maybe your user deletes their entire mailbox. But you need to figure out what kind of backups they do and what you can get restored if something happens. You want to know if the provider is still going to exist next year. That's a big one because if they're not, then you don't want to entrust them with their data. Um, and can you get that data out um, if you don't like that provider? Um, and one that really is only important for legal organizations but something to think about, you know, will they respond initially and immediately to a request from law enforcement uh, for you know, some kind of record? So something to think about depending on the kind of clients um, you are working with. But this is what you should be worrying about, not you know, is my data secure? Is it safe? And the fact of the matter is your data is never totally secure. It's never totally safe. But I promise you, that cloud providers are doing a better job of taking care of your data than you are really able to with the budget uh, of an average small to medium sized nonprofit organization. Thanks, Sam. Sam. And also we had a question that popped up where somebody was asking about um, is this true with HIPAA compliance too? So for organizations that work with social services, health and welfare organizations that have clients and personal medical data that they might have, are they able to use cloud providers and still be compliant with HIPAA with okay. having so, you know, data um, lineage HIPAA, and things like that? HIPAA and PCI compliance um, are questions I get all the time, constantly. And the fact of the matter is HIPAA and PCI have almost nothing to do with the technologies that you use. And they have almost everything to do with how you are using those technologies. So do users only have access to the resources that they need? Are you, do you have control processes for determining who has access to those resources? Do you know who is an administrator? Do you know who has what access? Are you reviewing the logs from the system? You know, what, what are you doing with this technology that you have? Um, and so really what you need to ask is, is this cloud technology possible to be HIPAA or PCI compliant since most of the work operates on your end? And the answer is almost always yes. These providers want your business, so they want you to be HIPAA and PCI compliant. Um, or they want you to be able to use their data if, if you need to fulfill those requirements. They won't necessarily tell you exactly what you need to be PCI or HIPAA compliant because that's mostly on you. But I can say uh, that Office 365 um, and our backup product, and you know, a lot of those products can be HIPAA compliant. But you should keep in mind that HIPAA compliant also says you can't send any patient information over email at all, over non-encrypted email. So you, know, you can't just sign up for Office 365 and think that you're HIPAA compliant. Um, Okay. You ready to move on? Great. Thank you. Sam, we have well, one other question that popped up where somebody was asking, um, what does granular mean? So can you explain kind of what that means sure. in, so, in regard so to backup? Sure. So granular means to what level? So first of all, what's the purpose of the backup? Is the backup to restore an entire server or an entire data center if it goes down? Um, or is that backup to protect, protect against a user doing something accidentally? Right. So the service could be running exactly the way it's supposed to run but you still lose data because your user does something or you accidentally overwrite something or something like that. Um, and the granularity refers to how specific an item you restore. Can you restore a specific email or do you have to restore an email folder or do you have to restore the entire mailbox to a particular point in time? Right? I want to restore this file. Can I restore this file from yesterday or from three days ago or from two hours ago or just from a week ago? Right? That's, that's the granularity of the backups. So those are good questions to ask a, party, a third party provider who you might entrust your data with in the cloud. Right. Okay. Um, so let's move on to moving your organization. And there's a lot to cover here. So I'm going to try and keep it brief, and I really encourage you to take a look at these slides afterwards. Um, so let's start with uh, an important distinction, which is native cloud services versus hosted infrastructure. So native cloud services, also known as software as a service, are uh, the things you typically pay per user for. Hosted Exchange, Office 365 is software as a service. Uh, Salesforce is software as a service. Software as a service means you are paying for a service that was built to be provided from the cloud. Right? You don't really need to know anything about what's going on in the background, uh, about what servers uh, or virtual servers or networking or any of that stuff to use most software as a service products. Hosted infrastructure on the other hand basically means you take what you have right now, you take your Exchange server, or you take as is, right? or you take your SQL database as is, and you put it in the cloud as a cloud 
server, as a virtual server that's running in the cloud, but it's still a server. It still runs Server 2008 or Windows 7 or, or whatever, whatever that actual application is. So it's, it's putting existing in, um, systems in the cloud. We are going to focus mostly on native cloud services. They are the biggest bang for your buck. You need to know the least about it. And that is what Office 365 is. Um, but uh, a couple of our features of our services as an organization are hosted infrastructure. So we will touch on them briefly. So um, uh, we are going to go over a matrix for each of the different systems in your organization uh, to sort of give you a comparison for how difficult it is to move those systems to the cloud. So how hard is it to get up and going with the cloud service, the actual configuration? How much work do I need to do on my local desktops or my local network in order to get the service working? Is it just kind of plug and play or do I have to make a lot of changes? How hard is it actually to move my data? Because data migration as we all know is one of the biggest issues. Um, and how cranky are my users going to actually be about the transition? Right? How hard is it? Um, so let's go on to um, these are the actual systems within your organization. And this is a pretty high level look. So we are going to talk about communication, file sharing, phones. So those are, those are high level sort of groupings of the systems that your organization uses. These three systems are pretty easy to move to the cloud. They are commodity services. Your users don't have to make a lot of changes. And there is often some really significant and immediate cost savings. Cloud desktops and cloud databases, um, are a little bit more complicated. You have to build something from scratch. Those are the, the infrastructure as a service services. Um, so those are a little bit more complicated. Um, so let's move on. I'm going to skip over some of these, but let's start here with communication. So communication means instant uh, messaging and video chat, email, screen sharing. And this is really what we're talking about when we talk about Office 365. So you can see here that the biggest issue uh, with communication is data migration. Because you have to move your email and your calendars and your contacts and your shared, your public folders all into the cloud. And, and that's not really that easy. Um, on the other hand, it's very easy for you to train your users on these new systems. Uh, now the benefits of moving your cloud, uh, your cloud, your communication system to the cloud, uh, the main one is less maintenance. Linda talked about this a lot. No more exchange, right? That's a big deal. Access to better tools. Um, so instant messaging, screen sharing tools, all integrated in the same place. It's all just one system um, and, easy, and a really easy transition. So unlike a lot of other cloud services, moving your communications and systems to cloud, particularly to Office 365, really doesn't take a lot for your users. Your users don't have to make uh, many changes. Um, so so I'm uh, sorry, I just saw a question about uh, Exchange. So Exchange just means uh, hosted. Uh, on your server you might have Microsoft Exchange, which is an email and collaboration system. So if you have shared calendars and shared contacts and an inbox, you probably use Exchange installed on your local server, um, although you might use uh, another solution. So file sharing is another really important bucket for systems that might be moved to the cloud. Um, and file sharing means both file storage and file collaboration. File sharing um, is another system that's pretty difficult to move to the cloud. And it's actually one that actually requires a lot of user retraining. Because typically you don't have exactly the same system in the cloud that you have on your local desktop. You're not going to your Z drive. right? You're probably going to a website. You're using different tools. And we'll talk about Microsoft SharePoint later, which is, Microsoft, which is Office 365 solution for file sharing. Um, the benefits for file sharing are, are huge though, even bigger than the benefits for email. With email, you're getting basically the same solution in the cloud. But with file sharing, you're getting a lot of new functionality. You're getting versioning. You're getting concurrent file editing. You're getting integration with all the normal work that you're doing. You're getting universal access at the same speed either for working from home or if you have an organization that's in a lot of different locations. A decentralized organization can, with these tools, have a centralized file sharing solution. Um, so I think this is a really important one to consider moving to the cloud. Um, okay, so how, I guess we're, we're running a little short on time. Um, so I think I might skip over. Um, you can see, we'll send out the slides afterwards. You can download them from the TechSoup website. Uh, and you can look over what it means to move your phones and your desktops and your databases to the cloud. Great. Thanks so much, Sam, for that. So with that, we want to talk a little bit about 
um, the case study that we have Stephanie Borton with us from ArtsReach, and she is at a smaller nonprofit with six staff that is in Philadelphia, and we would like to bring her on the line just to have her talk a little bit about what their experience was, why they decided to move their organization to the cloud, and what the benefits and drawbacks have been for them. So Stephanie, I'd like to welcome you to the line. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so uh, I am with a company called ArtReach. Uh, we basically ensure uh, that people who have barriers to uh, accessing cultural arts experiences are still able to receive them, and we do that in a lot of partnerships. Um, and everything we do uh, is basically based off of managing information and, um, and technology. Um, we uh, are a good case study, I think, because we were in transition. Um, I was at, over the summer acting as the uh, interim executive director. Um, and while I was learning all of these different uh, things to the job, uh, basically uh, our server crashed, just as <laughs> they've been discussing um, throughout this entire uh, presentation. Um, it wasn't the first time. Uh, the first time we decided it would be best uh, to try and fix uh, that server, and we were down for about um, two to three weeks. Uh, while um, uh, Tech Impact, then NPower, uh, was helping us do that. And, and when it happened the second time, uh, what happened was our server actually got a virus and was pronounced dead on the scene. Um, and so. Uh, with the help of Sam and uh, a couple other people at uh, Tech Impact, we decided we never wanted to have that happen again. And, and what do we do? And what is the next step? Um, I can tell you that they were instrumental in talking to me that is probably someone with the lowest common denominator of understanding of technology at our company um, in this precarious uh, position to make a really important decision. And so. Um, also with the um, oversight of some board members who did have some more, uh, were some more tech savvy than, than I, um, we decided that this actually was uh, the right way to go. And um, so uh, it actually turned out that, that I, you know, I, I have to tell you it was a process. Um, it, it, it took a while probably, I guess Sam, what, about a month maybe, be, it, from the time our server crashed until we were up in the cloud. Um, and it was a big learning curve uh, for me, but they were there the whole time. And I will tell you that we're pretty happy with it now. Um, we, everything that Sam's been telling you uh, is true. Uh, you can work anywhere. Uh, we do file sharing. We write a lot of grants. 85% of our income um, are, are through grants. And so uh, three of us can be working on a version at the same time and merge our changes. Um, we can uh, have one person look at it and, and talk about it and um, upload it when we're done. We check uh, actual files out if uh, we don't want somebody else to make changes and check them back in just like a library. Um, and I think the biggest takeaway for me was just to grasp this concept that it gives you more flexibility, but it really is the same kind of model as a server. Um, you know, the, Sam, as the as the tech guru, um, you know, really does understand the ins and outs. Me, I understand that I can still get to my files; they're still backed up. I've been able to get to them when our power went out, when we had um, Sandy come through the East Coast, um, and and it was a good decision for us. Is basically what I what I can tell you. That's great, Stephanie. Thanks for sharing that. And I imagine that you know, when I've worked at small nonprofits in the past, I've um, experienced outages, and we had a server that used to electrocute us if we didn't touch Ooh. the wall first. And yeah, I mean, a lot of I think a lot of small organizations that don't have on-premise IT support or have somebody like me, for example, who was the accidental techie where they would just say, "Oh, you you seem like you know what you're doing. Go fix the server." Um, Imagine if you're trying to decide between an upgrade to a new server on site or to the cloud, that it would take about that much time to get set up with a new server too. Mm -hmm. But it's not a quick two-hour process or something to get yourself up and running with a brand new system. So I think it's a, a useful experience that you share because I know 
I'm sure a lot of smaller organizations deal with that too, including many of the libraries that are smaller local branches that may not have IT support who are joining us on the phone as well. So Sam, do you want to jump back in and talk a little bit about what specific things you did for ArtsReach and how that worked? Sure. So ArtReach had a pretty typical uh, system. They had Microsoft Exchange for their email and their calendars and their contacts. Uh, they were using file shares for their files. Uh, and we actually moved both of those solutions to MP Office, um, which is our name for services around Office 365, around helping you as an organization get moved to Office 365. Um, ArtReach was an exception. Their server crashed. It was down. So we had to uh, pull the data out manually by you know, moving those hard drives around. But for most organizations, it's a much quicker process. We can actually do everything online without impacting your users in any way. We can do the, the mail migration over the Internet um, without impacting your users. And then we pick a time for a go live. We flick a switch, and now your users are in the new system. Um, ArtReach had a few local databases that they were using. Uh, and for, we actually used our backup system, MP Vault, uh, to back those up online. We kept them on site, but we backed them up online. And that was really an interim solution. And I think uh, you're, you're pretty much off of that, aren't you now, Stephanie? Oh, you we are much done with that. Else to the cloud. We, if that yeah. is gone, yeah. We're, we're on the cloud so, 100%. So that bought ArtReach some time to move those databases to native cloud versions, uh, which, is, which is really the, re the purpose for MP Vault, which is our online backup solution. Um, so I think, I think we, can, we can move on. Um, thank you very much, Stephanie. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And if you have questions about your specific organization um, and how that might work for you and your needs, feel free to put them into the chat because we will have time in a few minutes to start addressing some Q&A. So Sam, or I'm not sure if this was Sam or Linda who was going to address the uh, move the 80% with Office 365 and talk a little bit about um, what can move and what the NP Cloud offering includes. And then we'll also have, have Cameron from TechSoup jump on in just a couple of minutes to talk about the donation program specifically. Okay. Linda, do you want to take that? Um, yeah, sure. Thanks. So um, we really feel like of all the things that, and you saw the, the slide about um, all the things that ArtReach had on their server that took a nosedive on us. Um, it's, it's files, it's email, it's other collaboration um, information, but then it's the databases and, and probably a lot of um, people that are on the call now have that thing that they need to use. It, it's the accounting software, it's the client software, it's the, um, it's the case management software. And if those things are still residing locally on a server in your organization, um, we take a holistic picture and we look at that and we say, you know what, that's probably 20%, not 20% of what your users do, but 20% of what the server does. And how can we get the most bang for the, for the least amount of money? And we feel like Office 365 meets the need of 80%. So I'm clicking. Oh, there it goes. Um, so move 80% of the cloud for 20% of the effort. And, and this is just talking about Office 365 and how we can use Office 365. Communication meaning email, um, your email mostly, and your shared calendars, and um, that kind of work that you do, and then your file sharing. And we can do that through um, Office 365. And we can see that here are Office 365. So Microsoft Office 365, I should probably step back and explain it a little bit. Um, Microsoft Office 365 is, is Microsoft's online suite of services. And the behind the scenes technology that runs it are shown here on this slide in the middle. Uh, Microsoft Exchange Online, which Sam has already told, um, told you is how, you, how your email works and your shared calendars and what connects you, your email to your like Microsoft Outlook. Link Online, which is um, called a presence management software, which basically allows you and your coworkers to know who's available, who's got something on their calendar. Um, 
It allows you to do instant messaging or chat amongst yourselves in your office. And it also allows you to do um, online meetings. And those online meetings um, are really helpful to share your screen with a coworker that might not be in the same location as you um, so that you can share your screen and see the same spreadsheet and work on the same spreadsheet together and that kind of thing. And then there's SharePoint Online. SharePoint Online is an, is an intranet that allows you to do collaboration such as file sharing, such as not a shared calendar so that I know where you are or you know where I am, but a more public calendar. It might be a calendar of, any, of events. And the SharePoint allows you to set up different uh, what they call team sites. So you might have a fundraising and development team site where the calendar that shows on that page shows the, the golf outing or the gala or the whatever fundraising events coming up next. And you might have another one for your caseworkers so that you can see um, things like when reports are due or when the next training is coming up and that kind of thing. Great. Thanks so much, Linda. We need to jump through some of these slides pretty quickly so we yep. can get to the Q&A. So you got people it. can read these at home as well with uh, mm -hmm. more about what Office 365 is. That's right. And so and you can, like, like Becky just said, you can read it. Uh, this is what we do with Office 365. We use those three tools to um, configure the mailboxes and move your mail. Um, we provide training with Link Online. And then with SharePoint, we actually do um, hands-on planning exercise. We, migrate, we help you migrate your data, and then we do user training. And this is what we were talking about earlier, um, changing the way your users actually work and giving them tools that allow them to work in a different way rather than go have to log into the server, find the file. They're not doing that anymore. They're working as teams. They're working in team collaboration. So it's pretty, pretty great stuff. Um, finally, oh, sorry, go back, Steph, uh, Becky. I'm going to go to the um, the next slide for the offering on TechSoup because I think Cameron wanted to talk about that. Yep. So we'll go ahead and just bring Cameron on quickly, and she can tell us a little bit about the donation program that NP Office or NP Cloud makes available through TechSoup, and who's eligible. Hi, everybody. So um, based on the cloud survey that we had done um, earlier uh, this year or last year actually, and the response to that, we, you know, we began to understand that nonprofits really need more information uh, about how to get onto the cloud. Um, and so we've committed to trying to develop a, a series of offers that will help nonprofits understand what cloud services are available to them, how, how they can help, and then what we can do to um, help them move on to those services. So this is one of our first offerings. It's uh, from NP Office, and the offering is actually, or it's from NP Cloud, and the offering is called NP Office, and it's a consultation. It's a telephone interview um, to help understand, you know, where you are today, what's uh, where you would like to be in terms of um, your technology, and what the um, uh, what the process would be for you to migrate to a cloud service if you wanted to do that. Um, I've seen a lot of questions come up in the chat about how do we move to the cloud, what are the steps we can take, um, how do we compare services, how do we compare Office 365 to some other service. So this would be um, the first step that you could take. Uh, it's an admin fee of $10 through TechSoup, and it's consultation with one of the MP Cloud um, consultants. And uh, you would go through sort of what your existing infrastructure is and what um, and what it would take to go through, uh, go through a migration and what it would cost you. And the eligibility for this is the same as the Microsoft program. Uh, the only twist in this is that libraries can request Office 365 um, for back office systems as well as public access computers. And I know that's slightly different from the main donation program. But that's, um, that's available today on the TechSoup uh, platform. Great. Thank you so much, Cameron. And links to that offering will be provided in the follow-up. So go ahead and please send us your questions, and we will start answering them right now. But just before we do that, I want to just show you some of the resources that we discussed today. Um, 
you will get this slide deck shortly, and it has links to the donation program that we just discussed. And there are other resources as well, like Five Signs Your Nonprofit is Ready to Migrate, um, our whole resource section on the cloud for nonprofits and libraries with more articles, blog posts, assessments, webinars, things on the cloud and security, a lot of different topics that can help you determine whether it makes sense for you to move your organization to the cloud. Um, so with that, I want to hop over to the questions and start putting some of them out. So we talked about um, file sharing a bit. So Sam, maybe you can address this one. Are users able to maintain active directory and user groups if they move to the cloud? Uh, it's a complicated qu question. The uh, short answer is yes, and the long answer is uh, depends on how much work you want to put into it. Uh, if you go through the assessment, we'll explain uh, what's required. Uh, as I mentioned before, the sh file sharing portion in the cloud is provided by SharePoint. That's the solution we've picked. Um, and so it is possible to sync your Active Directory uh, with SharePoint and with the other online cloud services. Great. Thank you. Um, so I have a couple of questions that have come in that have asked a little bit about how does Office 365 compare to a different hosted solution? Somebody had mentioned um, Google Drive or Google for government organizations or education. Um, there was somebody else who mentioned – I can't remember what the uh, – I'm looking for the question here – but there was somebody else who mentioned a different service that they were using, um, a oh, remote desktop connection. So are there – Places online yeah. where people can do comparisons, or is there, that something you guys are, can help people I'll, determine in your assessment? We'll, we'll explain it to you, and we'll tell you if we think that another solution is very clearly the right solution for you. I mean, we're a nonprofit too. We're trying to get your organization the best solution we can. I, I will say briefly, uh, those are two separate questions. So one question is, how is this cloud solution different from other cloud solutions? And the other is, how is this cloud solution different from remote access to my current infrastructure? Uh, the second question is, is an easy one. Cloud solutions mean you don't have to worry about your Internet connection. You don't have to worry about paying for your server, paying for maintenance, replacing your server. Um, you don't need to worry about monitoring it. You don't need to worry about backing it up, all that stuff. Um, the other question is, is more complicated. The one thing I will say is Office 365 is going to give your users a very, very familiar interface. It works exactly the same um, as what they're doing right now with Outlook and with a local Exchange server. Um, the, so the, the features are fairly similar, but the usability and the user experience, um, and in some cases the integration with your local servers is, is really what sets Office 365 apart. Okay, thanks. We have a couple of questions of people asking about hosting things that are not currently um, cloud available, I guess. Um, things like, so Shelly uses Razor's Edge. Where would that data reside? Um, I noticed in the example from Stephanie that they had QuickBooks installed. And is that something that they also were able to move to the cloud? Or is that something that they keep locally still? So how does that work when you have other programs that you need to integrate? Sure. So QuickBooks is an interesting one. QuickBooks does have a cloud-based version, a web-based version uh, that doesn't offer all the same functionality. Um, but when, when you look at applications that don't have a native web version, or in the case of Razor's Edge, where that web version is just absolutely incredibly prohibitively expensive, um, then we look at infrastructure as a service, where we actually put a virtual server in the cloud specifically for your organization to host that application. So the application doesn't know that it's not on physical hardware in your network. Uh, and, and that's something that we do as part of our MP base uh, service. And you could call us for some more information about that. Um, we can and do the I same thing with desktops. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I would say as far as the Blackboard solution, is concerned, they do offer hosted um, Razor's Edge and Financial Edge. It's a matter of um, how complex, how many users, whether or not it's an affordable solution or whether it's right for you. The same thing with the QuickBooks Online. Um, most, most of these software companies are realizing the benefit to offering a hosted solution. And so even if it's not offered now, it probably will be in the near future. So if you've got a database that you're currently hosting on a server on-premise, chances are in the near future that, we're, that company or that vendor will have hosted solution available. But like Sam just said, we can also build a server, a cloud server for you to host that. Great. Thank you so much, Linda. So, we have a few more questions here. A couple of them are things about 
do we do you guys provide a hosted solution for SharePoint? And are there maximum limits on storage pay, space in SharePoint? Um, the answer uh, to both of those is, is yes. Um, the answer to the second one, uh, yes, there, there are limits. Um, they are complicated. They are also very large. Uh, and that's, really, that's why the assessment exists so that we can talk about what your needs are um, and, and go, through, um, you know, go through the options and what the limitations might be. There's almost always workarounds. Great. Thanks so much. Um, Heather asks, is it implied that data living in, my, in Microsoft Office 365 and SharePoint, is it a given that those are backed up? In other words, if our data is there, do we no longer need to have a separate backup system in place? Sure. That's a really good question. It is not implied. It is never implied. You should never trust that it's implied. But Microsoft publishes their backup uh, and recovery procedures. So they guarantee at a, I think it's a 99.99, .99, it might be 99.999% uptime. They geographically replicate, which means that your data isn't just living on one set of servers. It's living on two sets of servers in different physical locations. So if one data center fails, you can still get to your, uh, your Exchange mailbox and your SharePoint files. And they back up everything. I think they have a 30-day retention period. Now, do you still need to do your own backups? It depends on your needs. Um, so for Microsoft, you can restore a mailbox um, within I think 14 days uh, or maybe a month, and you can restore individual items between that mailbox within 14 days. So if you need greater granularity than that, you might need to do your own backups. But for the most part, uh, you can really trust that Microsoft is doing what you need. And that's really, I mean, that's one of the huge opportunities for cost savings and just for anxiety savings uh, with Office 365 or any cloud solution. But please, don't take that as implied. Always do your research. Right, that's a great point. And you know, Stephanie mentioned Hurricane Sandy and having that hit them. And we um, at TechSoup have a disaster planning and recovery guide where we talk specifically about the need for backing up. And we always recommend that any mission critical data that you have is backed up two by two by two. So two different people, two different locations, and two sets of backup. So always a good idea to make sure. So a couple of other questions we have. Um, you know, we had a couple of people ask, you know, saying they hate their current database. They don't know where to start, <laughs> but they know they want to change something. And so as a wrap-up, do you think we could give a few tips on how they can start to prepare their data to be able to move some tips on, you know, get your naming conventions in order on your files <laughs> or dump a lot of old email that you know you really don't need to hold on to, or whatever those tips are that you think would be a good starting place for people before for they sure. even make the so, call. So standardizing, reducing, those are all, those are all um, common needs. But I, I really think what you need to do depends on the different solutions. So when people say they hate their database and they want to move, really probably what that means is they don't like their donor database or they don't like their services database. Um, and moving those is usually more than just moving what you have right now to the cloud. It's usually moving to a different solution in the cloud, which means requirement gathering, um, which means vendor selection, which means doing interviews and doing demos, and then you know, paying someone to, to customize it. And it's a big project, and it's a pain. Um, and you know, we can help you with that. Um, or I know there's some good planning resources on, on the TechSoup website to help with that. Um, you know, as far as what to do to move for each of these different solutions, it really depends on the solution, and it really depends on what you're moving to, and it really depends on what you're moving from, and how many users you have, how much data you have, all of these, all these things, which is why we as an organization exist. I'm not withholding that knowledge. It's just you know, it's too complicated to sort of give a sound bite about. But please call us. You know, we'll, we'll help you out as best we can. Sure. So it sounds like the low-hanging fruit here is it's a great idea to get the donation program for the $10 admin fee, have the conversation, and do the assessment, and get your specific organization's questions answered so that you can move forward with what works best for your very specific needs. Because there are a lot of generalizations on this, but it may not be the right decision to move to the cloud for some of your stuff, and it may be exactly what you need to do for other things. Yeah, and that's what um, we're here to help kind of put the generalizations out, but we can't can't speak to the specifics without having that sort of consultation call. 
So with that, I would like to go ahead and start thanking our presenters because it is the top of the hour. So thank you so much to Sam Chankin again and Linda Woodup from NP Cloud or Tech Impact. And thank you to Stephanie Borton from ArtReach. I'd also like to thank Cameron Jones, the Senior Product Manager here at TechSoup who spoke to us about the donation program, and to Kevin Lowe who is helping answer your questions on the back end of our presentation. So join us with these resources. We'd also welcome you to continue the conversation in our community forums. which I will go ahead and open the slide up here and you can see the link to that. You will receive all of these slides in the follow-up email later this afternoon along with a copy of this recording and any links that we discussed. Thank you all so much. And please take a moment to fill out your survey so we can continue to improve these webinars for your use. And we'd also like to just thank ReadyTalk who provides this platform for us to present these webinars to our audience of users. And they are also available as a donation program through TechSoup. Thank you so much, and have a terrific day. <laughs>